Hello, my name is Christy Gillespie. I have been asked by Donegal Library to give a couple of small illustrated talks on Column Kill and I wish to thank them for the invitation. I promise that I will not bore you with detail and keep them as light as I possibly can. Given that this year marks the 1500th commemoration of the birth of the great saint, I thought it appropriate that we should maybe concentrate this first talk on his place of birth and on that general area surrounding Garden. Before I start, just a wee bit of background about how I got involved in the whole story of Colum Kill. It all began in 1993 when I was appointed principal of Skull Colum Kill in Charman, a small Geltic school which at that time had 100 pupils and a staff of four teachers. Terman National School is one of the 1300 schools in Ireland and Great Britain that are named in honour of the saint. This school could certainly lay claim to being the local school of Colum Kill as it takes in the children of the Garton area or around the lakes as it is known locally. Both the school and the parish area surrounding it is known as Terman because it is located within the Charman or sanctuary land that belonged to one of Colum Kill's many monasteries at neighbouring Kilmacrenan. This school is equidistant from where he was born in Gyarton, baptised in Temple Douglas, and where he first began his education in Kilmacrenan. He would eventually, as we will learn, come back to establish three of his many monasteries in this area. Just four years after my appointment, in 1997, it happened to be the 1400th commemoration of the saint's death on the 9th of June, 597. By the way, a saint's feast day always occurs on the date of their death rather than the more usual date of birth. This was because the day of death was considered as the day that they threw off their mortal coil and ascended into heaven and so a glorious or feast day. We decided as a school that we should do something to suitably mark that commemoration and in the end we decided on compiling a book about the saint. We planned that it would give an outline of his life in the first half and that the second part would contain a detailed guided trail of the saint's local area, taking you from site to historical site, explaining what could be seen on the ground when you got there. Up and until the publication of that book, the saint's local area had in truth received scant coverage. Most books about Colum Kill would mention all right that he had been born in Gyarton before whisking him away on his educational tour then leading on to a setting up of monasteries before leaving Ireland for Iona to spread the good news throughout Alaba or Scotland. You all know this well-thumbed pattern. But where you are born and raised, I am sure you would agree, has much more of an importance in your formation. Quite apart from your genetics and the family or clan grouping into which you are born, surely your area moulds you far for better or for worse into the type of person that you become. This book did very well for us and sold out two editions. Many the time since I have been asked for copies. So I have been hard at work researching to go again and to bring out a much larger and updated version of the original book which will be titled In Column Kill's Footsteps. We followed up with a Columban map of the area showing the main Columban sites with detailed information about them on the back. We then finished our Colum Kill projects with the building of a Columban monument beside the school, a 3D version of, of, as such of the book. It was designed to resemble the abbey remains of Kilmacrenan, and it features a replica of the window of Temple Douglas Church and the Garton Oratory Door. A stone from each of the Columban sites in the area were set into the walls. Among these 36 stones is a lintel stone from the original monastery in Kilmacrenan, as well as a mitred head sculpture that once sat above the main door of the later abbey there. Also included is a stone from Martyrs Bay on Iona Island. And now, as we approach the 1500th commemoration of his birth this December, I think it appropriate that we should maybe focus some attention again on his birthplace and local area, as well as on his mother Ethna. We will look at the important role that she undoubtedly played in not alone promoting Christianity in that area, but also in steering her son into a life of monasticism. Colum Kill lived a millennium and a half ago. To put that into some kind of perspective, a generation lasts for a span of 30 years on average. So to get back to the time of your great-grandfather or great-grandmother, for example, would take 90 years. 
To get back to Colin Kill's time, you are looking at 50 grades. Plenty of time for history to be lost and forgotten, which is exactly what has happened, and also indeed for stories to be made up or added to. And given that in the intervening millennium and a half that much fable and legend has built up around the saint, not to mention self-fulfilling prophecies and poetry that he was supposed to have composed, then it can sometimes be a very hard task to separate fact from fiction. But thankfully, we have some useful written sources to pull from. These include the three lives of Colum Kill. The earliest life of the saint was written on Iona by Colum Kill's successor, Aunan in Irish, or Adamnan in Latin, whose name we have simplified as Eunan. He was the ninth abbot and a very accomplished man in his own right. He lived a hundred years after the saint died and had the opportunity of interviewing monks who had met or had known the saint. However, his book is not a straightforward account of the saint's life, but is instead a hagiography, or a biography that presents its subject in a very holy light. This life is divided up into three sections, giving accounts of Colum Kill's prophecies, his miracles, and his angelic visions. Yet, by studying this collection of short stories carefully, you can pick up a lot of vital information about the monastic way of life on Iona and other important background information. This image here is of the Dorbenya copy of Adamnan's life, the oldest to have survived, which was completed some 30 years after the original. It is named after the scribe who copied it and who would, who would himself go on to succeed Adamnan as abbot of Iona. This lovely manuscript is now held in Schaffshausen in Switzerland. The next of the three lives was the middle life written in Derry around 1150, which for the first time lays out Colum Kill's life story in some sort of chronological order. We know that the location for this account was Derry because it was at that time the head and centre of the Columban Federation of Monasteries and is pushed very strongly as being Colum Kill's first monastery and also the best loved by the saint. Last but not least, we have a very large Donegal life, or Baha Colum Kill, finished in 1532 by Manus O'Donnell. Manus was grandfather of Red Hugh O'Donnell, and who, five years after compiling this major work, was to take over as chieftain of the O'Donnells. These O'Donnells believed fervently that they were the direct descendants of the saint's clan. This manuscript was completed just 11 years after the thousandth anniversary of the saint's birth. Whatever commemoration that had been held at that time undoubtedly gave the future chieftain the inspiration to get a team of Franciscan monks together who he sent out all over Donegal and the rest of the country researching all of the stories and tales, both oral and written, pertaining to the saint. It was all brought together, translated, and then written up in O'Donnell's castle in Lifford. It is a huge book and contains a lot of useful information on the beliefs and the practices that had built up concerning the saint in the thousand years since his birth. The Bodleian Library in Oxford has the original manuscript with this depiction of Colum Kill and his regalia on the back. Of course, a lot of information can also be garnered from the various annals, from the earliest the annals of Ulster, through to the much later annals of the Four Masters. What all of these annals have in common is that they use as their early foundation source a collection known as the Annals or the Chronicles of Iona. These lists were compiled by the monks there, where they began to properly document the history of Ireland and Britain for the first time, year by year. Written somewhat like newspaper headings, they note the important happenings of the time. This chronicle of Iona does not survive in its own right, but you can see evidence of it right throughout the earlier sections of later annals that depended on it for their early source material. Honourable mention should also be given to the Venerable Bede, the English historian monk who wrote the first detailed account of the ecclesiastical history of Britain in 732, about 130 years after Colum Kill had died. He gives a good account of Colum Kill coming to Scotland, and he also details information on how St Aidan, one of the Ionian monks, founded Lindisfarne Monastery in Northumbria and then strove to bring Christianity to the people of Northern England. Bede gives a very concise account of how Columban monks lived and operated, making their own lives an example to those they were trying to convert. 
There are, of course, loads of other sources of information. Chief among them is this folio held in the collection of Durham Cathedral. This was written at the same time as their copy of Adamman's Life and lists the name of Colum Kill's brother and sisters, as well as naming the twelve that accompanied him as he left for exile in Iona. These are the only such lists in existence, and without them, we would be much the poorer when it comes to hard information on the saint's life. There are, of course, these, those are, of course, all written sources of information. Indeed, historians would point out, and rightly so, that there is no documentary evidence at all that Colum Kill was born in Garton until it was noted in what was to become known as the middle life of the saint, written in Derry around 1150. But as we have seen, it was actually the monks on Iona that were the first to start writing down history in a systematic manner. And so this period around when Colum Kill was alive and all that came before him is prehistory as such, and so we often have to look at other sources in helping us to build a narrative. You have often heard the saying that something has been written in stone. There is actually a lovely saying around the Carlingford area of County Louth that goes, if you kick a stone, then it will tell you a story. And that is so true, as so often you will find the history of an area written into its place names and its sites. And like the spokes of a great cartwheel, as you get closer and closer to Garton, not only do the sites associated with Colum Kill get much more numerous, but so also do the place names which demonstrates a clear connection with the saint and his clan. Because in Irish, all place names describe their setting perfectly, either geographically or it may be something to do with the location's history instead. To give you a very good example of this, the area across Loha Kibben from Garton, where Colum Kill was born, is known as Chirargus, which is the largest town land in the parish of Terman and Garton. Chirargus means the land of Fergus, Fergus being the paternal grandfather of Colum Kill. This townland has undoubtedly been known by this name since before Colum Kill's time. It demonstrates that the area was under the control of Colum Kill's grandfather, being as he was the chieftain of the local clan, who ruled both there and the much wider area surrounding it. We'll kick off our story to the background of Colum Kill's birth with a character that we all know well from our time in National School, being Niall of the Nine Hostages. He was King of Connacht and became nominal High King of Ireland from roughly 379 to 405. He got his name from extracting sons from his various underkings to ensure their allegiance and good behaviour. It was while he was on a raid to Dumbarton that he brought Patrick back to Ireland as a slave. Patrick would eventually escape, but would come back and do much to kick-start the Christianising of this country. Niall had at least eight sons from his two marriages, which gave rise to the E. Niall, or Sons of Niall, dynasty. The first four took the area of Cougamija, including Tara, and became known as the Southern E. Niall, or Sons of Niall. Meanwhile, the other four moved north and took over the northwest part of Ireland. Two of these were Owen, who took Inishon as his territory and had as his chief residence Green and Alia, and Connell, who controlled most of what we would call Donegal today along with an additional area as far as the River Foyle, now covered by parts of Derry City. He gave his name to the county, Chirconnell, and his kinsfolk were known as the Kinnell Connell, or the Clan of Connell. The Book of Fina tells us that this territory of Connells, or effectively Donegal minus any shown, was in turn subdivided into three between his sons, and it appears that Colum Kill's grandfather, Fergus, was granted control of an area between the River Swilly, flowing through Letterkenny, as far as the Crawley or the Dore River. This Dore River, which separates the parishes of Gidor and the Rosses, takes its water from Lochinur Lake before making its short journey out to the sea. Fergus, if you remember, is the man who gave his name to the townland of Chirargus, opposite to Garton, where Colum Kill was to be born. This kingdom would eventually be passed and turned to Fergus' son, Philemy, father of Colum Kill, who married Ethna. She most likely came from Royal Leinster stock, but from where exactly, we are not sure. So Colum Kill was not just born into any ordinary family, but had plenty of power and prestige on both sides, which was to open many doors for him later as he tried to build up his own ecclesiastical kingdom. 
It appears that Colum Kill's mother Ethna did much to help bring Christianity to the area, as the original name for the monastery at Kilmacrenan was Dira Ethna, or the Oak Grove of Ethna. Now this name Dira Ethna reveals much. The oak was a sacred tree for the pre-Christians, and they performed their sacred rites and clearings or groves in their oak woods. Early Christian evangelizers actively sought out these groves into which they would site their first churches and small monasteries in order to give them a religious import. So it is safe to assume that this small monastery of Dura Ethna was not long a Christian site and that the name clearly supports the view that Ethna was sponsoring this new Christian settlement here. There is also a holy well nearby on the very boundary of the land belonging to that monastery in Kilmacrenan. It is in the townland of Barnes and Terman and is known as Tuber Ethna. Now it is very unusual to have a Christian well named after someone who wasn't an Irish saint, and so she must have been held in very high esteem by those in the locality. It was in one of the father's many forts, this one guarding the area of Garden, that Colum Kill was born on the 7th of December 521. One can still see the ramparts of this ancient hill fort surrounding the graveyard there. It was called Rathcano, the hill fort of the nuts, named after the many horse chestnut trees that still grow to the front of this venerable site. We are told by Manus O'Donnell that on the night before Colum Kill's birth, that his mother had a vision, where an angel instructed her to go down to Loch Akibbin below the hill fort, and there she would find a flagstone, the birthstone, and that it was to be brought back up to the hill fort. She brought some of her kinsfolk with her, and on their way back carrying this stone, they journeyed through the small Altahuri Glen, which was the shortest route. This is a small secluded glen through which a swift stream flows on its way down to the lake below. We are told that the group stopped for a while to rest where the sickness of childbirth came on Ethna. With the birth of the baby now imminent, they resumed their journey back to the hill fort. One of the kinsmen who was helping with the carrying of the flagstone began covering up the bloodstained area where Ethna had been resting with bracken and leaves. Aware of the holy significance that this man was placing on this spot, Ethna assured him that his efforts were unnecessary as nobody except himself and his descendants would ever be able to locate it. This location was to give rise to where the famous garden clay is lifted to this very day. It is a medium porcelain clay which is lifted by male members of the local Friel family only. They begin to lift this clay after reaching a certain age of maturity. They recite specific prayers, and when the clay is then lifted, it is brought back home to be dried out. If the clay is needed for some reason, then you approach a member of these Friels who will give you a small packet of it. When researching for the Column Kill book back in 1997, I asked Dan Friel, who was a parent of the school at that time, why it was him and his family that had the honour of doing this. He could shed no further light save to explain that his father and grandfather before him had done it, and so that it was very much a family tradition passed on faithfully from generation to generation. But on doing further research, I was to discover that these particular friels are actually direct descendants from Cullum Kill's only brother Owen, and therefore the kinsfolk, and so this practice may very well have been going on now unbroken for the past 1500 years. The clay itself has plenty medicinal properties, and locals would never consider going on a journey without it. It has naturally over the years caused some consternation with customs officials at airports, given as it often presents as a small bag of white powder. Colum Kill was born on the birthstone, brought up to the hill fort, on the 7th of December, 521. For many centuries, thousands of pilgrims would come to this flagstone right up and until the end of the 16th century. But eventually this stone was to disappear, possibly as early as plantation times. As a result, the actual birth site was to become confused with another location, which had and still has its very large flagstone in situ and which also has a Columban legend attached to it. This is the nearby Yaknakua, less than a mile further to the west. Yaknakua means the flagstone of loneliness. Manus O'Donnell, in his Life of the Saint, tells us the background to how this flagstone got its name. 
Once he, Colum Kill, was in a certain place called Garth Nilecki, or Field of the Flagstone in Garden, westward of Rath Kano, the place where he was born. A local man came to him because many of his friends and kinsmen had died, and he was heavy and sorrowful after them. The extent of his sorrow was so great that he would rather die than live after them. And when Colum Kill saw him, he had great pity for him, and he blessed the flagstone that was beside him, and gave that man water from it to drink, so that his sorrow disappeared. And Colum Kill left as a grace on that stone, that the sorrow of anyone who would drink from it would leave them. And from that time this has been verified. And the flagstone of the sorrows, Yach Nakua, is the name of that flagstone today in memory of that great miracle. So as you can see, Manus O'Donnell in the 1530s was well aware of this flagstone's existence, but he is at pains to point out that it is to the west of where, he, where Colum Kill was born, which was Rathkno, or where the graveyard is now. But sadly, if you go out to visit at present, there are brown historical signs placed on the roadside which point up to Lyaknakua as being the birthplace of the saint. This has added great confusion and they really should be taken down. What probably didn't help was when Mrs Cornelia Adair cited a large Celtic cross beside Lyaknakua. It is on the border of her estate and very close to where the last of the 47 families, the Bradleys, had been thrown out of their cottages during the Derry Bay evictions of 1861, initiated by her husband, the infamous John George Adair. After his death in America, she tried to make restitution of sorts, including the erection of this cross. In light of her husband's despicable actions, it is rather ironic that she had Colum Kill's last instructions to his monks incised on this cross, preserve with each other sincere charity and peace. In fairness to her, she does not mention anywhere on this cross that the location is the saint's birthplace. On the evening before some of these evictees left to emigrate to Australia, they came to this flagstone of loneliness, hoping that the terrible sadness of leaving their local area forever would not hit them too hard. According to local tradition, Colum Kill himself also visited on the eve of leaving Chirconnell for the final time as he set out on voluntary exile to become a pilgrim of Christ, as Adam puts it. Following his birth, the infant child was immediately brought to the nearby church of Temple Douglas and baptised by a monk named Krachnahan. This clearly demonstrates that Christianity had already gained an early foothold in the area. Although this holy water font in the church in Kilmacrenan is reputed to be the one used to baptise the child, this one probably came from the later church in Temple Douglas or alternately from the nearby abbey in Kilmacrenan. Manus O'Donnell informs us that the original font was sadly disposed of. He tells us that for many years the sick would be brought from far and wide to this flagstone on which he was baptised to seek help. But it was to become a heavy burden to the lady tasked with being its guardian or her hereditary keeper. So the accursed woman put the blessed stone in a flax dam of water north of the settlement there and it hasn't been found since then. But there is a prophecy that it will be found and that the place will prosper from then on. The infant was given the Celtic name of Crafan, or Fox, not an unusual name at all when you read through the various analytic e entries of the time. While he was still very young, his mother was to send her son to Kilmacrenan under the fosterage of Krachnahan, his baptizer, to begin his first steps in this new life of monasticism. Now, the young lad could very easily have followed in the path of his father and grandfather and become head of his powerful clan. But instead, a completely different career was being mapped out for him. It appears as a result that overall control of the clan then passed to the branch of his uncle Setna instead, one of whose sons, and a first cousin of Colum Kills, would eventually go on to become overall leader of the Kinnelconnell, and first from that clan to be titled High King of the Enail. Another son, Lugia, got control of this heartland area, and so this portion between the Swilly and the Crawley rivers became known as Chirluja, and the clan the Kinnelluja. It would be from this base that the O'Donnell family would eventually emerge to take over the county. 
The young Columkill or Crefan was sent to Crechnahan's small monastery, which was situated close to where Kilmacrenan town now stands, out the modern day Milford Road. This foundation, which consisted of a church and at least one house, was built on a rocky spur of high ground between the Lennon and Lorgi rivers. It was known as Dera Ethna at that time. Crechnahan was soon to realise that his young foster child was blessed by God. Adamnan tells us the tale that one night as Crechnahan returned from seeing his office in the nearby church, he saw the whole house bathed in a bright light and poised over the face of the sleeping child was a fiery ball of light. He began to tremble and bowed his face to the ground for he recognised that the grace of the Holy Ghost was poured from heaven upon his foster son and he stood in awe. It most probably was this incident that motivated the change of the young boy's name from Crefan to Colum, the Irish word for a dove. For as Adam, Adamnan so beautifully puts it, so great a name cannot have been given to the man of God but by divine providence. For it is shown by the Gospels that the Holy Spirit descended on the only begotten Son of the everlasting Father in the form of that little bird. For the dove is indeed a simple and innocent bird, and it was fitting that a simple and innocent man should have this for his name, who through his dove-like life offered in himself a dwelling for the Holy Spirit. What it says in Proverbs is appropriate here. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. There is clear evidence that during the saint's lifetime, and for some time afterwards, that he was simply known as Colum, or Columba in Latin. This was his monastic name as such. The kill you would come only much later as in column kill, column of the churches, denoting the many churches and monasteries that both the saint and his followers founded. He would eventually leave Krachnan and Dara in order to further his studies, chiefly in Leinster. He finally came under the instruction of St. Moby in Glasnevin, Dublin, where in 544 a plague epidemic hit and the abbot was forced to disperse his monastery sending his charges back to their homes. He gave very strict instruction to Colum Kill not to found any establishment until he had given him his blessing to do so. Colum Kill was roughly 24 when he returned home to Chirconnell. He was immediately offered Dedicology by his uncle Setna, a hill fort surrounded by a forest of oak trees on an island in the River Foyle. But mindful of Movi's instruction, he had to refuse. Coming from the Dune or Hillfort, he was approached by two messengers, one carrying the girdle of Moby, while the second brought his permission to begin building. Colum Kill's former mentor had succumbed to the plague, which was ravishing Ireland. Moby's death is noted in the annals of Ulster for that year. Colum Kill was to build his first monastery there in Dedicology, or Oak Grove of Colliga which began a series of foundations in the northern half of Ireland in the territories of the Enil. They were usually clan hill forts or small churches already established. It is a futile exercise to put a number on just how many, as it is impossible to say, which were established by Colum Kill himself and which were founded later by his community. Colum Kill was to found three of these monasteries at locations important in his own life story and which were under the control of his family. Firstly, there was Garton. Although it is now 1,500 years old, there are still remnants of the original monastery there on the ground. There are the ramparts which first surrounded the hill fort and which was later used to enclose the monastic buildings. Then there are the two very weathered crosses which delineate the extent of the monastery proper. The original site of the monastic church was right in the middle of this site, being as it was the centre of the life of the monastery. The holy well would originally have been the source of drinking water for the hill fort that preceded the monastery there. There is the half remains of a horizontal cairn stone used to grind corn and barley and the bell of this monastery that once called the monks to prayer. Up and until the plantation, it was in the possession of a local Onahan family, its hereditary keepers, but it eventually ended up being sold and is now in the National Museum of Ireland. He also went on to make the monastery in Kilmacrenan much bigger. 
Kilvik Nening had been known as Dere Ethna, but once taken over by Colum Kill, it was left in the charges of four of his nephews, sons of his sister Minchonleth, and her, and her husband Nenang, who is also remembered in the townlands of Lis Nenang and Machra Nenang in Letterkenny. And so you get Kilvik Nenang, or the Monastery of the Sons of Nenang. One of the most satisfying achievements of the previous Column Kill book was in managing to pinpoint for the very first time the location of the original monastery here. On that day, and standing on site, having finally figured it out, I suddenly noticed a fox looking at me from some rushes not ten yards away. He looked in my direction for about ten seconds before slipping stealthily away. Make from that story what you will. The third monastery in his local area was Temple Douglas, where he had been baptised and where he was reputed to have taken his first steps. There was once a revered station done there on the saint's feast day for people with afflictions of the eyes. But the local priest put a stop to it in the early 1860s to combat the sale of poaching, which was causing a lot of unruly behaviour on what should have been a very solemn day. Looking at the rest of Donegal or Chirhunnel, you had a Columban establishment on Torrey where you can still see the tall cross and the remains of a round tower on that rocky outpost. This is also where the famous Torrey clay is lifted, which, different to its cousin Garton clay, helps to keep rodents away as well as protecting fishermen against drowning. Glen Colum Kill is the only parish in Ireland that bears his name. It was known as Shanglan in ancient times owing to the extensive number of Stone Age megaliths found there. The saint is supposed to have banished the devils and non-believers out of the glen and then taken it over. There is a fine series of ancient standing stones and other holy sites which make up the Thurith on Cullum Kill's feast day. It is the longest in Ireland which begins at sunset and must be completed by sunrise. The monastic settlement is believed to have been situated on the site where the present, present Church of Ireland now stands. And to back up this theory, while digging a grave there for a man by the surname of Foles in 1832, the grave diggers chanced on a souterrain running underneath the graveyard, which in monastic times would have served both as a coal storage as well as an escape route if attacked. Drumholm is one of only three Irish monasteries mentioned by Adam Nunn in his Life of the Saint. Drumholm is near Ballantra, where the first proper archaeological dig of a Donegal Columban site has been undertaken, giving us a much clearer idea of what life was like in an early Celtic monastery. Also in Donegal you had Rafo, which like many of the other Chirconnell monasteries, is to be found on the very borders of that territory. Outside of Donegal, you had the likes of Doro, or Daraway, the place of the oak, in County Offaly, which was during Colum Kill's time his main Columban monastery in Ireland, and mentioned by both Adamnan and the Venerable Bede. Not a lot is now left apart from a high cross, some grave markers, a holy well, and, of course, its association with the famous Book of Doro, one of the earlier Columban illustrated Gospels. In the Dublin area, you had Thord, meaning pure, from the Holy Well there. This place name is now anglicised as Swords, where there is still a very fine round tower. Thord Column Kill is most noteworthy for being the monastery church where the body of Brian Brew was brought for waking after the Battle of Clontarf, before being then brought onto Armagh for burial. Muin Column Kill or Moon in County Kildare, is known for its very fine, slim, high cross, the illustrations of which used to feature on RTE television. Then there is Drum Cliff on the road from Donegal to Sligo. The road actually cuts through the monastery, with the remains of the round tower on one side, while one of the high crosses stands guard in the cemetery on the other side. WBH chose to be buried here in a monastery dedicated to the poet saint of Ireland. Yeats's paternal great-grandfather was once the pastor there. One mile away is the battle site of Kuljerevna, 
where the combined forces of Colin Kill's clan met those of the incumbent High King Jermyn in 561 in a major battle that not alone allowed the Northern Inyale to take over the High Kingship from their southern cousins, but was undoubtedly also an important factor in Colum Kill leaving the country just two years later. Although the reasons behind this battle were quite complex, a later narrative would attest that it centred around the well-known story of Colum Kill surreptitiously copying a book of Psalms, and when its owner St Finian of Movila, one of Colum Kill's former teachers, found out, he demanded his book back along with the ill-gotten copy, but Colum Kill refused. The case was referred to King Jeremot, but when he found in favour of Finian, Colum Kill still refused to hand over his copy, and so the battle lines were drawn. Two years after this major conflict, Colum Kill, with 12 of his followers, was to leave from Derry for permanent exile. He founded a new monastery on the small island of Iona off Mull, off the Scottish coast, from where he moved to convert the tribes of Alaba. He would die there 34 years later in front of the church altar after midnight on the 9th of June, 597. Iona would carry on as head of the Columban Federation in Ireland, Scotland and Northern England for another 200 years where it became a place of pilgrimage and the burial site of many kings from a number of countries. That was until the early 1800s when after repeated attacks and sackings by the dreaded Vikings from the north, it forced a partial withdrawal to the relative safety of inland Kells and County Meath, where a new monastery was completed in the early 800s. Kells was then to become the Canonath, or head abode of the Columbans, for the next three centuries. It is, of course, most famous for the Book of Kells, which, although mostly, almost certainly fashioned on Iona, was moved for its safety to this new monastery, where it was housed for the next 700 years. But soon the Vikings were ransacking Kells also, as were the various warring local factions, which resulted in the numerous burnings and destructions as noted in the analytic records for that period. And so in the early 12th century, the head office was in turn moved to Derry instead. A chapel moor or great cathedral was built to replace the small original monastic church where the diminutive St Augustine's Church now stands. It was here in Derry that the middle life of Column Kill was written around 1150, which, as well as trying to put some chronological shape on Column Kill's life story, also records Garton as being the birthplace of the saint for the first time. But instead of Derry growing to become the centre and head of the Columban Federation for the next couple of centuries, it actually was to witness its demise instead. For a long time, monasteries had ruled the roost in Ireland, controlled as they were by their local clans. This was a, not a situation that was very palatable to Rome, and so a diocesan system was introduced, each diocese controlled by a bishop, under strict instructions from the Vatican. These new dioceses mirrored the territories once controlled by their local clans, which is why the Rafo diocese is Chirconnell or Donegal without Inishowen, while Inishowen Peninsula is in the Diocese of Derry, along with Derry and Tyrone, once controlled by the Kinalone. New orders were taken in from the continent, such as the Cistercians and later the Franciscans, and so the Columban order ceased to be. A new Cistercian abbey, for example, was built on Iona to replace the old Columban monastery and was built literally on top of it. Around the same time, Colum Kill's clan, the Kinaluiach, who were to become known as the O'Donnells, were to break out of their local area and take over the whole of Donegal. Yet they would always come back to their homeland to inaugurate each new chieftain. And just as their ancestors had done before them, the first part of the ceremony took place at the monastic church of Kilmacrenna. They would then move out in procession with the inauguration stone along the way of the kings to Dune Rock. This ceremony couldn't have taken place without the head of the O'Friel clan, the closest blood relatives of Colum Kill being present. The 22nd of these O'Donnell chieftains was Manus O'Donnell, the grandfather of Red Hugh. Like all fellow Irish chieftains, he had to be steely-minded and tough in order to achieve control and then to keep it. Into each fight with his enemies, his forces would carry the Cahach or battle book, the book of Psalms supposedly copied by Colum Kill as a battle standard. 
It was born by his hereditary keepers, the McGroarty family, in an ornate kudach or box. But Manus was also a refined man of letters, as well as being a skilled poet. 1521 had been a notable year, being the thousandth commemoration of the birth of his illustrious ancestor, Colin Kill. It seems to have sparked Manus into a number of projects to suitably commemorate the saint, where he had three buildings erected at sites important in the saint's life story. At Garton, his birthplace, his baptismal site at Temple Douglas, and where he was first educated at Kilmacrenna. Now, we have no definitive proof that it was he who planned and bankrolled these buildings, but they are all 16th century in date and of a similar build. And one has to question as to who else would have been either had the wealth or the interest to take on such an ambitious building program at that time. The third and largest of these buildings, the new abbey in Kilmacrenan, is undoubtedly where he himself was inaugurated in 1537. Five years before his inception, in 1532, he had finished the monumental compilation titled Baha Colum Kill, or The Life of Colum Kill, in his newly built castle in Lifford. He had tasked his team of Franciscan monks to go out and collect all the written and oral tales pertaining to Colum Kill, which were put together and trans translated over a period of around 10 years. What resulted was a huge manuscript of detail, folk tales, and legends, as well as many short verses of poetry. We get the likes of the story of the copying of the Caja, or battle book, the story of Garton Clay, and the birthstone for the first time. Just 70 years after this manuscript was compiled and the abbey completed, all was to change utterly. Following defeat for the Irish Confederation in the Nine Years' War and the subsequent flight of the earls from Rathmullen, the English were to implement the plantation of Ulster, which resulted in the old clan ways dying out forever. The harsh penal laws were then to follow. These actions were to result in the likes of the O'Donnell inauguration stone and also the birthstone of Colum Kill disappearing, and their whereabouts are still not known to this day. The birthstone, which Manus tells us once had thousands flocking to it looking for cures, was over time to be replaced in folklore by Yach Nakui, or the flagstone of loneliness. And so, as you can see, history is constantly being lost and made up. As we mark another commemoration, it has been the motivation for us historians to have a look at the whole story again and to try and shed new light on some of the detail that has been lost over time. It has been a year like no other where many events planned as commemoration have had to be deferred or cancelled during the dreadful pandemic. And yet there is a Columban precedent for all of this. Adamnan tells us that one day on Iona, one of Colum Kill's monks remarked that if and when his master would pass away, that people would sail from all over Scotland and Ireland for the saint's funeral. Colum Kill overheard him and corrected him, prophesying that only his familiar monks would perform his funeral rites and sing his requiem. During the saint's wake and funeral, the winds became so strong that it was not possible for any boats to set out to sea and go to Iona. Immediately after his burial, the seas became perfectly calm again. Let's hope that we too experience this perfect calm for ourselves very soon. I hope that you enjoyed this wee talk where we've just scratched the surface really. If you have any question or comment that you would like to make on it, you can contact me at this email address, stcolumkill at gmail.com. Thanking you so much for tuning in.